Well, hello and welcome again to our online Bible study that we call God's Message to the Church in these last days. And we've been looking at Discipleship 101. We have went through the building blocks that were people of the book, talking about the B-I-B-L-E, that we meditate, we think about, we study it. We study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We're also people of worship that we give, we offer our praise and our thanksgiving unto the Father because of our response to what He's done in our life, how we've had a supernatural encounter with the supernatural God who has intersected with our life and has changed and transformed us, and therefore we offer Him a response of praise. And then we're people of prayer, that the Bible says pray without ceasing, and that we are to ask and keep on asking. We're to seek and keep on seeking. We're to knock and keep on knocking. That the Lord wants to move, but we have to open the door. We have to uh, give him permission to intervene in situations because some people say, well, he's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to. It's true. He is sovereign of the universe, but he gave dominion of this world over to us, and he will not usurp our authority until we give him permission to do so. Now, he can speak to us, he can warn us, he can try to teach us, but it is up to us to open the door. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Anyone who will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will sup with him. But you see, he's not going to bust through the door. He's not going to usurp our authority. He says, you have to open the door. If you'll open the door, then I will come in. I will intervene. And we'll talk about that more as we go along. But we uh, also are people of fellowship, that we're not in this by ourselves, and that even as Jesus sent his disciples out two by two, and he chose 12, and then later it became 70, and then 120, and the numbers grew as time progressed. But there is that connectivity that we have with one another, and it is so important, especially in these end times, that we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together because we need the prayers and the support of one another. For my group that I am, well, as part of our discipleship, part of my prayer is that I pray I lift up those that are part of my group. They're on my prayer list every day. And it's very important that we stay connected to one another. <clears throat> Sure, you can say, well, I can be a believer. I can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I, that doesn't mean I have to be a part of a body like a church. Well, you can believe, and you can have a relationship with God, but that's not how He designed it to work. He says it should work in a community as you're working together you hold each other's arms up. Just like Moses, when the children of Israel first went to war after they had been released from their slavery, Moses went up on the mountain and he had Aaron and Hur on each side of him. But as long as he held up his arms, the nation of Israel was winning. But whenever he dropped his arms, they were losing. And so finally, they had Moses sit down and Aaron and Hur were holding up his arms and they were victorious in the battle as a result. That's a picture of the fact that we need each other to hold up our arms because sometimes we get tired and weary and, 
And it's so important that we encourage and strengthen and help sustain one another in our warfare because we're in a spiritual battle and especially now. And then we're people of compassion that we look to the needs of others and we try to be a blessing to them. We try to help and reach out to, to the orphans, to the widows, to those who do not have any source of income. And we try to help them out in their time of need. So then we have progressed now into what kind of people should we be? What kind of characteristics is the Lord looking for? And so we've been looking at the Beatitudes. And we looked at the first one that says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now the second one is, Blessed are they who mourn. And we have said, well, this just does not, to the natural mind, it does not make any sense at all. Because who wants to mourn? But blessed means those <clears throat> who think or meditate on the Word of God and the Son of God, they will receive abundant life. And as we meditate, as we study the life of Jesus and we see what he went through and the suffering that he endured there's a blessing in knowing what Jesus went through for our salvation and so we said that there's a flip side to everything in life there's a time to be born there's a time to die there's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry there's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. And until we experience both the flip sides of the equation, we really have not encountered or experienced life to its fullest. Now, we've said that there are eight Beatitudes that we find there in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 3 through 10. And again, we've already looked at the first beatitude and the fact that apart from the Lord, apart from Jesus Christ living inside of us, we can do nothing. But Paul said, through him, we can do all things. So there's a flip to that, a flip side to that. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. So for us to think that we can have self-confidence and that that's what we need to be successful in life. No, apart from Him, we will not be truly successful. Not successful in the way that it will be a blessing in the long run. But we're not without Jesus Christ if we've, ex it off, uh, we've allowed Him to come in and enter into our lives then we're not without Christ, and we can do all things through Him. So now we're focusing on the second of the Beatitudes, and that is, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we said there's different types of mourning, and one of the types of mourning is godly sorrow, that we mourn a life of regret, perhaps, of our sinfulness, our waywardness. Even as a child, I understood that I was not what I was supposed to be. I knew that I was a sinner. And when the, the pastor or the preacher would give a message, there would be a conviction in my heart. I would know that I was a sinner. And there is a blessing in knowing this and repenting and going to the Lord and saying, this is who I am. But as we begin this lesson, I just want us to uh, spend a time, since we're people of worship, and part of worship is singing. So <clears throat> here's a song, My Jesus, I Love You. And it speaks of the fact 
that all the follies of sin I resign. My Jesus, I love thee. I know that you are mine. So let's worship together with this song. Father, we come into your presence and we just thank you and appreciate what you have done for us, Jesus, that you are the one that we love because we think about the thorns that were on your brow. We think about the pain, the suffering that you endured for our sins and for our salvation. 
And we come before your presence just with thanksgiving in our hearts. And we come into your courts with praise as we bow before you. And as we offer you our heart, our life, and everything that we are, Lord, because you did the same for us. We love you because you first loved us. And you demonstrated that love and that while we were yet sinners, you were willing to go to that cross and die for us. So we thank you and we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So as we're looking at this second beatitude, we're experiencing God's comfort in our pain. In the book, The Shack, if you've read the book or if you've seen the movie, I just want to share an excerpt out of that book. And this is Papa God that is speaking to the main character, Mackenzie. Mackenzie has suffered a tragedy in his life. And he is full of anger. And he is angry with God because God he believed that God allowed this to happen. So he ultimately blames God for what happened. But here's Papa God speaking to him in his pain. And he says, you try to make sense of the world based on a very small and incomplete picture of reality. It's like looking at a parade through the tiny knot hole of hurt, pain, self-centeredness, and power, believing you are on your own and insignificant. All these thoughts contain powerful lies. You see pain and death as ultimate evils and God as the ultimate betrayer, or at best, as fundamentally untrustworthy. Untrust you dictate the terms and judge my actions and find me guilty. And then Papa God says, the real underlying flaw in your life is that you do not think I am good, and until you do, you'll never trust me. Well, for those of you that have seen the movie, Paul Young, who is the author of The Shack, he has done uh, some follow-up episodes. The, these episodes were being filmed even as the movie The Shack was being filmed. So in episode, uh, there's several episodes that gives you the backstory of The Shack, tells you a little bit bit about Paul's life and some of his experiences and some of the ways that he looks at life. And uh, in episode 9, he was sharing part of the story behind the shack. As the movie was being made, uh, and at the time that Paul was uh, film, uh, filming episode 9, he had never seen the movie at that point, but the producers, Lionsgate, had called him and invited him to come and to watch as they filmed. And uh, so he had an invitation at one time and he went and he was very glad that they were open to allowing him to be a part of it. But then he gets a second invitation and they are filming in British Columbia. And uh, so they offered him to come and to watch again the filming of one of the scenes in the shack. He didn't know which scene it would be. They didn't say, and, and he didn't really know where the exact location of the filming would be. But he said, great, I'd love to be a part. So he had read a book by a man by the name of Brad Jerzak. And the name of the book was A More Christ-Like God. You see, in the movie, or in the book, Mackenzie could relate to Jesus, but he couldn't relate to God. It was like good cop, bad cop. 
He see he saw God as the bad cop, and he saw Jesus as the good cop. So he couldn't relate to God, who he believed was angry and wrathful, and who would judge people and and bring uh, eat, you know disasters upon people. But he loved Jesus, you know. So that was the problem. So. This title of the book that Paul had read, A More Christ-Like God, well, that's exactly, you know, the way that the main character in the shack, that's how he felt that God needed to be more Christ-like. <laughs> but anyway, he, did, he had never met the author of the book, but they had corresponded together through emails. And since... This man lived in British Columbia. He thought, hmm, maybe I can meet up with him while I am on this trip. But he also knew that this man was a seminary professor in London. And so he didn't even know if he'd be in the country or not. But on a whim, he sent an email to Brad. And he said, you know, I'm going to be... Uh, in British Columbia on Wednesday, do you think we could get together? And Brad immediately wrote back and said, absolutely. And then uh, Brad offered to pick him up at the airport. And uh, so after checking with uh, the people uh, if the, to see if that was okay, they said, sure, that would uh, save us a lot of time if Brad would pick you up. So uh, Brad was, you know, hoping that they would be able to spend a meal and, and have some conversation. Well, as they were uh, emailing back and forth, uh, about 10 minutes later, Brad sent him another email. This time he attached a photo on the email and uh, he said, you won't believe this, Paul. But Brad, at that time, he and his wife were spending time at a cabin at a friend's house. Uh, his friends were Dwight and Lori. And uh, this couple had, just a few years before, had lost a daughter through suicide. Their youngest daughter had committed suicide out in the woods. And so, as Brad had been emailing back and forth with, uh, with Paul, uh, he was walking with Brad, I mean with DeWitt, Dwight. He was walking with Dwight down around the lake there in British Columbia. And he said, you won't believe this, Paul, but two and a half blocks from... Dwight's cabin where we're staying we found a sign and it says the shack and it has an arrow pointing in a certain direction and they said we think that that is pointing to one of the locations where they're filming filming the shack and Paul thought well that's pretty cool but again he didn't know what location that they would be filming when he got there, but, you know, it was very interesting. And uh, so Brad was hoping that Paul could meet this couple, Dwight and Lori, who had lost their daughter through suicide. And Dwight had told Brad, you know, I want to read the shack again, but I can't get through the first chapter. And Lori, she would not even read it. She was just angry. And she was going through therapy. And her therapist had encouraged her because she didn't even want to meet with Paul at all because she was still grieving. She was still angry. She was still upset by what had happened. But her therapist encouraged her. So anyway, Paul gets there and they meet together and, 
and he meets Brad and he says, we, we were, you know, we just bonded together immediately. It was like we were brothers, that we were long lost brothers. And as it turned out, coincidentally, that the place where they would be filming that Paul would be watching was the exact location that Brad had said that two and a half blocks from uh, Dwight and Lori's cabin, that's where the shack location where they were going to be filming this particular scene in the movie. And so Paul uh, lets the director and producer know what's going on. And of course, they're very supportive. And when Paul gets uh, to the scene to be a, you know, to watch and see what goes on, he asks them if it would be all right if he had his four friends come and be a part of it as well. And they said, absolutely yes. So his four friends, about 20 minutes later, show up. And it just so happens that the scene that they're filming at that time was the first morning that the shack had been transformed into this beautiful, beautiful cabin. And he had met up with Papa God and with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus. But that night, he had had nightmares like he had had many, many times as he was uh, going back over the tragedy that had occurred in his life. And he was angry and he was upset and depressed that next morning. And so Papa God had cooked breakfast for them and he was out on the porch and again he was he was not in a very good mood but here she was singing and and she was very lively and and uh, and so at one point here is Mackenzie that is so He's trying to distance himself from Papa God. He, he can relate to Sarayu, the Holy Spirit, and to Jesus, but he's having a hard time. He's having a difficulty relating with Papa God. And she says to him, Mackenzie, the real underlying flaw in your life is that you do not think I am good. And until you do, you'll never trust me. Now that's the line in this scene that she says to Mackenzie. And as Dwight and Lori are listening to this and seeing this scene, and they're seeing that Mackenzie is sitting there on the steps of the porch with his arms crossed in a very bad mood, that's exactly how Lori is feeling at that moment. And there's tears flowing down her cheeks as she hears the word from Papa God. Now, when you film a movie, they don't just film it one time and that's it. They like to get different camera angles and uh, let the actors maybe use a different inflection or say it a little bit differently. Uh, and so they did this 12 times. And here is uh, Paul and his new friends. They've got their headsets on and they're watching the monitor. And they're hearing this over and over and over. The real underlying flaw in your life is that you do not think I am good. And until you do, you'll never trust me. I wonder how many of us can relate to what Mackenzie was going through in this novel, in this fiction story. 
I wonder how many of us have been at that point. That we wonder, God, why did you allow this to happen? If you're sovereign, why didn't you do something to stop this? And you know, I was, I was thinking about that. What do we want God to do? Lock us up in a closet and put us in prison until all the hurts and pains of this world are, you know, we're shielded from it. What, what do we really want God to do? God warns us. He tries to speak to us. That's what it says over and over, especially in the Old Testament, how God would try to warn and, and speak to the children of Israel. But they were so stubborn and rebellious, they wanted to do things their own way. They, they didn't want God. They wanted to be like everybody else. And when they became like everybody else, and when they worshipped like everybody else, it brought disaster on their own head. But then they would blame God for allowing it to happen. How many times has a parent told their child, don't do this, you'll hurt yourself? Or a teenager, no, you can't go to that because they'll be you know, doing things and you'll be tempted and, and yet a teenager wants to be accepted and wants to be part of the group. And, and they become rebellious and they slip out and they go behind their parents' back and they do things and they know it's wrong. They know it's wrong. They've been told. They've been warned. And yet they do it anyway. And then they get into trouble. Or even they, they hurt themselves or even kill themselves but it's not because they haven't been warned and it's not because they haven't been told not to do it. What do you want God to do? Lock you up in a cage and not let you out so that you'll never be hurt? So you'll never experience pain or loss? What would you want Him to do? Well, get rid of the evil people? It's just like in the, the book, The Shack. At, at the end, Papa God is wanting Mackenzie to forgive the very man who had brought about a horrible, horrible, horrible crime. And he says, I don't want to forgive this man. I want you to send him to hell. And Papa God is saying, you don't know this man's story. You don't know what he's gone through. You don't know what has made him become the kind of man that he is. You don't know how his father treated him. And, and he's just reflecting what has been done to him. So who should I judge? Should I judge this man or his father or his father? Or should I go back to Adam? Should I have never created anyone? What do you want me to do? Because I have given you dominion of this world. I have given you principles to live by. I have told you, here is the way that your life will be blessed. If you will follow these principles and these guides for your life, you'll have abundant life. But if you choose to go in the opposite direction, here's what's going to happen. Now God gives the answer to the question. He says, choose life. But the problem is that we don't. How many times do you think that God has tried to help us? How many times He's tried to speak to us? How many times He's tried to warn us not to do things? And yet when thing, bad things happen, it's all the way, you know, we always go back to, why God, why did you let this happen? We always want to blame Him. It's like a parent, you know, trying to discipline their child. You're mean. You're bad. You won't let me do what I want to do. And then when we let them do it, and they hurt and ruin their lives, 
It's like, why did you let me do this? My sister, she always wanted to play the piano, but when she took piano lessons, she didn't want to do it. And then years later, she's saying, why didn't Mama make me do my piano lessons? Well, it's because you didn't want to do it at the time. You know, <laughs> you're blamed if you do, and you're blamed if you don't. But the real underlying flaw in your life, in my life, is that we don't think that God is good. And until we do, we'll never be able to trust Him. You know, we can say the little phrase, God is good, all the time, God is good. But can we say that when we're going through a heartache? Can we say that in our pain? That's a different story, isn't it? But the psalmist said in Psalm 23, 4, Even in the valley of the shadow of death, even in this dilapidated and broken world, the Lord is with us. His rod and His staff, they comfort me. His rod for correction and His staff to rescue us they comfort us. We need the rod of correction, whether we like it or not, whether we, we resist it or not. But some people are so stubborn and rebellious that they hate the rod of correction. And only when they get in trouble are they wanting the staff of rescue. But the Lord never leaves us. He never deserts us. You know, the part in the shack where it's talking about, where were you? Where were you when I needed you? And he was thinking about Jesus on the cross when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Mackenzie had always thought that God had forsaken Jesus on the cross. And God, Papa God, says to Mackenzie, I never left him. I never deserted him. And she has Mackenzie look at her hands, her, her wrist, and he sees the nail prints in her hands. And he said, what are, what are they there for? You know, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. You know, when, when a child suffers, a parent suffers. God was there. It was the worst day of his life, so to speak. What Jesus went through at the cross. And even though that may be how we feel, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In our brokenness, in our pain, to know that His Word says, I never leave you, I never forsake you. I am there. And my presence is there to comfort you. The Apostle Paul said, just as we have borne the image of the man made of dust. This is talking about Adam. Remember in the beginning, God created man from the dust of the ground. And we've borne the image of the man made of dust. We will also bear the image of the heavenly man. You know, one of the words that God gave to His people. And I'm using the words because the Jewish people do not say the Ten Commandments. They say the Ten Words. These are the words of the Lord. And He says, You shall have make no other image. You shall not make a graven image. The reason being is 
that in the beginning he made man in his image. So when we look at one another, we are looking at the image of God. When we look into the face of another person, we're looking at the image of God because we were made in His image. So when we hurt another person, we're hurting God. When we hurt ourselves, we are hurting God. We are made in His image. And the Bible says, how can we say that we love someone else? How can we say that we love God when we don't love our fellow man? Because our fellow man is made in the image of God. How can we say that we love God if we don't love man? And if we can't love someone that's right in front of us that we can see with our eyes, how can we love the invisible God? It's just things to think about. So the opposite of godly sorrow or teshuva, which means repentance or turning, the opposite of that is a profane worldly happiness. We want to eat, drink, and be merry. We want to have a good time. And I get so burdened when I hear someone say, Oh, God wants us to be happy, happy, happy. He wants us to be blessed, blessed, blessed. Blessed goes deeper than happy, happy, happy. The worldly happiness is something that won't last. The godly happiness, the godly blessing is something is for a lifetime. It says, oh, the misery of those who love this world, for they will receive no consolation in the world to come. If all we care about is what is happening in this life, John wrote in his letter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus said, lay up your treasures in heaven. So, in other words, don't put your love on things that are going to corrupt and that won't last. So when we think about mourning, it's pentheo, which means to lament. It pertains to godly sorrow. Godly sorrow comes from a person who is poor in spirit, one who realizes their need, who says, without, apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. It's, it's not self-confidence, it's God-confidence. It's putting our trust, our faith in Him. And so, godly sorrow means mourning over the gravity of sin. What we've done, the mistakes, the, the sins that we've committed that's really messed up our lives. Destroyed not only our life, but, but maybe other people as well. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world. Yeah, you can eat, drink, and be merry, have a party, ha have a big time, but in the end, where's it going to leave you? For observe this very thing that let me go back, I'm sorry. So observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. So blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see a father wrapping his arms around his children and bringing comfort to them in their pain, in their loss. This is how God wants to be with us. 
you know, there is something very, very intim intimate about being comforted to have someone wrap their arms around us when we're suffering a loss or a pain in our lives. There is a bonding that you wouldn't have had it not been for the circumstances. It is a reaching out to someone else and letting them know that you are with them and you're supportive of them and that you love and you care about them. Well, that's the way that God is. And you know, our scars, they tell us that we've had pain, that we've had a hurt of some means or uh, fashion in our lives, but they're also a proof when we have scars that there is healing. In Psalm, I'm, I'm going to close with this, Psalm 51 if you read at the beginning of this psalm, um, it will have a little background as to what was happening and what was the circumstances that the psalmist was going through when he wrote this psalm. And in Psalm 51, just an introduction to this psalm, it says to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him, after he had gone in to Bathsheba, when David had committed adultery and then had murdered her husband because she became pregnant. And David tried to cover up his sin. And then Nathan the prophet confronted him. And then this is David's prayer. He says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. You would think in verse 4, against you, against God, you only have I sinned. Didn't he sin against Bathsheba? Didn't he sin against her husband Uriah? Didn't he sin against the nation for what he had done? Didn't he sin against the unborn child as a result of his adultery? But here he says, God, it's against you and you only have I sinned. I knew it was wrong. I disobeyed you. My sin is against you. I shouldn't have done this to start with. I sinned against you, Lord. And I've done what is evil in your sight. So he knew that God was right and justified in judging him. So my prayer is, That in the midst of our pain, that we would realize that God is there to comfort us. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Amen. Amen.